Welcome back, everyone. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today because we are going to be talking about a topic that I think many people will find helpful, imposter syndrome. And to do that, I am excited to be joined by Claire Yosa, who is an expert in this space. Claire, welcome to the show. Hi, Cassie. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, of course. I'm really, as I just said, really looking forward to this conversation. So before we jump in, let me properly introduce you to Claire. Claire Yosa has been a leadership mentor since 2003. She's the author of eight books. You heard that right. Eight books, including Ditching Imposter Syndrome, which I have right here, um, and Dare to Dream Bigger. She is a certified NLB trainer who got trained in 2003 and is also a formally trained meditation and yoga teacher, a reformed engineer, and the former head of market research for one of the UK's most disruptive companies. Claire is regularly interviewed by the international press, is a member of the UK's Institute of Directors, and speaks internationally about how to change the world by changing yourself. Claire has spent over a decade specializing in empowering passionate world changers to do the inside work so that they they can get on with making a difference in the world. And that is what we'll be talking about today. So with that, and before we jump into talking about imposter syndrome, I'd love, Claire, to hear about your career journey and really what brought you to this work. You know, you've brought together this, you know, analytical side. You were, you've been an engineer, you have an engineering background, and then blended it with, you know, this capability with mindfulness techniques, really to address this need in the world, essentially to, you say, in, empower passionate world changers to do the inside work, and it is inside work, so that mm-hmm. they can make a difference in the world. So what brought you to this path? So I studied engineering because I thought studying German and Russian would be too easy, as you do when you're (laughs) 17. (laughs) I know that sounds totally crazy. That was my logic. And I had a boyfriend when I was 16 who was building a kit car. And I was learning about how the engine works. And I went to my physics teacher and I said, why do the cylinders in the car fire in the order that they do? And he went, I don't know. So I thought, okay, I'll go and find out. And so I studied engineering and I tied it in with the German because I love languages. So I studied some of my degree out in Germany. I picked a university that didn't do automotive engineering. So I didn't get the answer to that question until I graduated. And then when I did graduate working in the UK, working in Germany, I specialized in diesel engine manufacture. And I was one of the first people in Europe to be trained in Six Sigma. And I loved Six Sigma because it helps you to take the fluff out of a process. Yeah. So if we, whether we want to build an engine or design a sales funnel or make a pitch to the board, Six Sigma has really helped me train my brain to go, this bit makes a difference and that bit just distracts people. So out it comes. Yeah. But after about 10 years, I realized that actually it wasn't engines and things that excited me. It was people. My nickname in the factory was Smiler. Yeah, I used to, the first thing I would do every morning is go around the shop floor, get a smile out of everyone, try and lift their spirits. And I realized I wanted to be able to do that more purposefully. Um, there was a lot of Me Too stuff happened in the factory, unfortunately. So I, I actually took a sabbatical, went traveling, came back from South America and ended up as head of market research at Dyson because... That got me to be able to be the translator between the customers, the engineers, and the marketing team. And after a few years, it was absolutely incredible, including doing the USA launch. I realized I needed to make a bigger difference, and that meant I needed to be running my own business. I'd been studying psychology, NLP. So I set up a leadership development consultancy back in 2003. I've since studied so many more things, and what I love to do is combining that the engineering common sense, the practical psychology and neuroscience of performance with the demystified ancient wisdom to create things that reach the parts that mindset level techniques just can't touch. Wow. I really love hearing about your journey because what is present for me is how um, present you were to both being in what you were doing at the moment and really uh, loving what you were doing in the moment, but noticing at certain moments like, huh, there's something more here. And what I'm really passionate about is this, and I want to go deeper here. And then going and doing that and again, paying attention and kind of understanding at in that moment, okay, what's next for me? So 
that I think is a great lesson for people to kind of take away in terms of paying attention to their career. And I also love that you took a sabbatical. It's something that I Mm. kind of champion and yet a lot of people don't do and are nervous to do. So I love that. I just really appreciate hearing this arc of your career. Uh, It was incredible. Um, Best part of a year in New Zealand, um, Argentina and Peru, and then finishing up in the States. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's the thing, as you've said, and this is very apparent in reading your book that you've like throughout this time, since you started your business, business, continue to kind of deepen your, Mm. your learning and, and take in um, or learn about different modalities. But if we, and you're applying that now to all of the work that you do. So I want to go back and kind of now talk about like, well, what is imposter syndrome really? Because I think it gets really confusing and a lot of people end up just using that term very broadly. And, and maybe that's that's appropriate. But when you think about imposter syndrome, you know, can you give us a, some sense of how we should think about it? And, and even if it's a syndrome. <laughs> so great first point there. It's not a syndrome. So syndrome would be clinically diagnosable by a doctor or a psychiatrist. It's actually the imposter phenomenon. But I don't know about you. It feels like I'm wearing false teeth when I try to say that. Yeah. <laughs> So calling it imposter syndrome, it's the label it's been given. It's the common usage name. So the way I define it with my clients is it is the gap between who we see ourselves as being and who we think we need to be to achieve our goals or dreams. And to get over that gap, we build what I call the bridge of coping strategies, which we can talk about later if that's of interest to your listeners and your viewers. But the key thing with imposter syndrome, it is the fear of being found out. Mm-hmm. It's not good enough. So we might have low self-esteem and think I'm not good enough, but imposter syndrome has that secret source of what if they realize? Yeah, that's how you know it's imposter syndrome. When I ran the 2019 imposter syndrome research study, one of the things that we found is there's a difference between imposter syndrome and self-doubt. And a lot of people are conflating the two. So self-doubt is about what I can and can't do. It's my skills. It's my abilities. It's my knowledge. Imposter syndrome runs up much more deeply. It's about who I am. What if they find me out? What if they realize they made a mistake hiring me? What if they realize I am a fraud? All of this I am language means it's down there at the identity level. And so the mindset level positive thinking techniques that we use normally to get through with limiting beliefs and confidence, they're not strong enough to get down there and deal with imposter syndrome's triggers. On the other hand, though, it's great news because a lot of people are just running self-doubt. There's air quotes there around the just because it feels very real when we're running it. But self-doubt you can fix by getting yourself some some subject-specific training or skill-specific training or getting yourself a coach to help you with the mindset stuff. So what I've spent the last 17 years doing is dedicating my research, my experimenting, my client time to seeing what can we do to really get down there. So that those who are struggling with imposter syndrome can have a light at the end of the tunnel and know how to set themselves free, how to close the imposter syndrome gap. So they no longer need the bridge of coping strategies and they can allow themselves to become the person they were born to be. Yeah, I love that. I mean, this I hear as well very often from my clients. And it's this distinction that you're bringing up between, you know, is it just self-doubt or a confidence issue, or perhaps I'm on my next growth curve. And so Mm. that's why you're feeling uncomfortable. And, you know, what do you do in those situations versus, hey, no, it is this deeper thing. And I think it's just become this shorthand in our lexicon, in our culture to just kind of say, oh yeah, I'm suffering. I I have that thing, imposter syndrome. And I wonder if that does get people stuck because both of these are factors, just like you're saying, and your book does a great job of of dealing with both circumstances, right? Um, And so what is, from your perspective, you kind of just alluded to it, Claire, like what's really important about us making this distinction? Because you you said like, well, with self-doubt, you can go get yourself trained and you can deal with that. There's still some other work one Mm. needs to do to kind of help with that. But like, is it that if you really have imposter syndrome, it's just more insidious in terms of its impact on you? Or so what's what's really helpful for people in, in this distinction, clear distinction you're okay. making? Because I, I think it's really important too, to be honest with you. Because yeah. again, I, I hear from a lot of people, they just default to this term imposter syndrome. And I think it I think it actually disempowers them 
and makes things a little bit worse, perhaps. Absolutely. It can become a badge of honor because one of the biggest myths around it is that it's incurable. Yeah. Mm. So it becomes something we have to cope with. So let's take the example of a presentation. Maybe you've got to pitch an idea to a team at work, or maybe you're pitching to a client. If what you're running is self-doubt, because there's a skills gap, as I call it, then getting some presentation skills training will close the skills gap. It will increase your confidence and you'll do a great job. If it's imposter syndrome, you can get that same training and it will help a bit. But that secret 3 a.m. self-talk is still going to make you self-sabotage the presentation. Yeah. So when we're looking at it from an organizational point of view, it's one of the major reasons why soft skills training doesn't work is because you can develop the skill. But if imposter syndrome is running below the surface, we will still hold back on showing up as all of who we really are when we execute that skill. That's super helpful distinction. And so I'm, I want to come back to, to, you know, in your research, you mentioned your research, it, there was a high percentage of us that do actually kind of, I, I don't know if you say that do then suffer from imposter mm-hmm. syndrome, but why is it that so many of us suffer from it, even high performers? Especially high performance. Mm. So with high performance, it's often because we've set ourselves such high standards. And then we just beat ourselves up if we don't meet them. One of the things that I found is is happening more and more. It's it's the advent of social media. I'm not looking to blame social media, but social media gives us more opportunities to compare ourselves with others and find ourselves lacking. More than you know, imagine back in the 1980s, you had to work quite hard to find someone to compare yourself with who wasn't in a magazine. Now you just open your phone and it gives you 30 options. And I talk about imposter syndrome as being the secret fear of others judging us the way we're judging ourselves. So if we're judging ourselves and we're not comfortable in our own skin and we're running the fear that we'll somehow be found out as this, then we assume that everybody else is judging us too. And comparisonitis, where we compare ourselves to others, find ourselves lacking and beat ourselves up about it, we judge ourselves again, is one of the major drivers for imposter syndrome. Because if we're running self-doubt, then we're up there at the behavior level. We're evaluating our performance. I can do this. I can't do this. What could I do better? With imposter syndrome, we're taking that evaluation and we're moving it down to judging. So I messed up that bit of that presentation. Therefore, I am rubbish at presenting. Yeah. So we've got so many more opportunities to compare ourselves. The the world is so much faster. So chronic stress is because it's become commonplace for so many of us. And this is another factor that exacerbates imposter syndrome. Mm. So can you say a little bit more about that? This like the chronic stress that is exacerbating it? Absolutely. So what happens when we think a negative thought, yeah, a a worry thought, a fear-based thought, it fires off biochemical reactions in the body that are completely automatic. The stress, the adrenaline, cortisol, all of those hormonal reactions, they then create our experience of emotions. So in their simplest form, as a meditation teacher, I I always have a plexi screen up for the rotten tomatoes on this. In their simplest form, an emotion is just a chemical reaction in the body. Okay, They're not as real as they feel. They then feed more thoughts that feed the biochemical reactions that make the emotions stronger. And suddenly a tiny trigger has fired off the whole inner drama queen, inner drama king thing. Mm. What happens when we're stressed is those triggers can be smaller and have a bigger impact because we're already dosed up with the stress hormones. We can also end up after chronic stress, so long-term, low-grade stress in something that's called hypervigilance, which is where we're like kind of a shark with a radar fin looking for threats without even realizing it's what we're doing. So a throwaway comment from Joe in an email will suddenly feel like a personal attack on us and our sense of self. And if we're running imposter syndrome, it can fire off a whole episode, whereas actually what Joe meant to say was just, I don't have time to write a proper response, so here's my one line. Yeah, And when everybody's stressed, everybody's firing off everybody else, and what we found over the lockdown, because we're doing the 2021 research study at the moment, is it hasn't created new cases of imposter syndrome, but those who are already running it, it's become more severe and more frequent Because a lot of the coping strategies we used to have don't work anymore. You can't just pop by somebody's desk for a cup of tea. (laughs) Sorry, a cup of tea, as you know, in Britain fixes everything. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you you don't have 
the same network connection. We're in meetings and we're much more focused on the meeting outcome rather than the chat in the hallway outside just saying, what did you think Joe meant with that comment? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be so excited to see your 2021 uh, survey results, your research results, because I can imagine there is going to be a lot of interesting learning for people coming out of that. Yeah, just the impact of this time. You know, you mentioned previously, and you say this in your book, you started to make this distinction between judging and evaluating. And you say like the single biggest key to setting yourself free from imposter syndrome is really the shift from judging to evaluating. I was wondering if you could say just a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So when we're evaluating, as I said earlier, it's all about our performance. And, you know, if we're ambitious, we need to be able to evaluate the outcome of our actions because otherwise we're just going to turn into a sloth or a sloth, however you pronounce it, yeah? We need to be able to say, okay, that bit got a great result. That bit being tweaked could improve this. With imposter syndrome, we've shifted the evaluating to judging. So we also have set up filters in our brain to filter out positive feedback. So we might go, yay, that bit got a great result, but actually chances are you wouldn't even notice that bit got a great result. So you will just block that out completely. You will focus on the bit you need to improve and you get into this whole existential crisis. I'm a terrible person. I'm going to die alone in a gutter because I forgot to ask that question during that particular meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or my brain froze when I was put on the spot. So it becomes so much bigger a deal. We also lose what's called the internal referencing system when we're running imposter syndrome. That's how we decide for ourselves whether we've done a good enough job. So if you have somebody in your team who's running imposter syndrome, they need an awful lot more feedback, a positive feedback and encouragement than somebody who's not. But if you have a manager who's not running imposter syndrome, they won't know that. And I had a client, she had been promoted to partner, which is a very senior level in UK companies. She said she worked an entire year in that new role. Every morning, three o'clock in the morning, what if they fire me today? What if they realize today is the day that they made a mistake? She got to her performance review one year later and her boss gave her an outstanding. She had no idea because she'd lost the ability to evaluate her performance. Mm -hmm. And all she was able to do was judge herself for the stuff that she could see she hadn't done well enough. That's a really helpful distinction. Um, And you're talking about this, uh, you know, if you're within the environment, right, and you're a manager or even for yourself, I'm wondering, are there shorthand clues that people should be looking for or paying attention to either for themselves to kind of take and you have in your book, you know, a, a quiz that one can go through to kind of see, mm-hmm. are, am I really suffering from imposter syndrome or phenomenon um, or, or is it something else? But are there shorthand clues that for ourselves or for managing others that we should be paying attention to or looking out for? There definitely are. So if you're managing somebody and you think it might be imposter syndrome, classic warning signs are they might share a great idea with you one-to-one, but then they don't speak up in the meeting like you agreed. Or you might see them back down as soon as their idea is challenged. You might see that if they're put on the spot with a question, they'll suddenly clam up, face go red, that kind of thing. If during these remote and hybrid working times, you're on a video call, you might find they stop putting their screen on and they're not interacting as much. So these are all warning signs. But there's also a model we came up with from the research called the four P's of imposter syndrome. So it's really useful to look for changes in these. So the first P is perfectionism. That's setting your standards so unbelievably high that there's no way you can reach them. And if you do, having worked all the hours and made sure everybody else is working all the hours too, you'll just write it off as a fluke. Yeah. Oh, anyone could have done that. So perfectionism. The next one is procrastination, which I know none of us ever do. And that's kind of filling our time with busyness so we can avoid the thing that's triggering imposter syndrome for us. The third P is project paralysis. This is that frozen rabbit in headlights. We ignore the project completely until we can use the adrenaline of the deadline to push on through and get it done. And then the fourth P is people pleasing. So this is going into a meeting with one set of priorities and coming out with another because it's what Joe wanted. Apologies to Joe. Yeah, Joe's lovely. Yeah, or, or coming out with 20 extra tasks that weren't really yours because we want to feel like we belong. So the four Ps, the perfectionism, procrastination, project paralysis, and people pleasing, 
if somebody is suddenly showing more of those, particularly if they've just been offered an opportunity to shine, more visibility, if they've had the tap on the shoulder about maybe stepping up to the next level, then these are warning signs that you need to do something. But unfortunately, most people don't spot it until it's too late. And particularly with women, the chance of being promoted can often be enough to make us leave an organization we love because we are so scared that that will be the one step too far. That means that the imposter syndrome bridge of coping strategies will fall apart and they will finally find us out. Wow. And that's like a critical, you know, as we are seeing even during this time, I'm sure there's, there are definitely other factors impacting women leaving the workforce right now. But you talk yeah. about how like the the wage gap is like imposter syndrome is a big, you know, factor in that. It is. We found in the research study, it's one of three core drivers, hidden drivers in the gender pay gap and lack of gender equality and also lack of BAME equality in leadership roles. And Without dealing with imposter syndrome, as well as fixing the external environmental and cultural factors, without dealing with imposter syndrome, what you risk doing is taking that person, putting them into the role that you can see as a leader they should be doing, and having them completely fall apart. Mm. Yeah, mm. A rising star can turn into a micromanaging bully boss with a toxic team in just a few weeks if imposter syndrome strikes because they were put into a role where the imposter syndrome gap widened beyond the reach of the bridge of coping strategies. Wow. It's a really interesting and, and helpful way of kind of thinking about that. And just to, to simplify kind of what happens in those moments. Um, mm -hmm. And I was curious about this because, and I, I think I might not be phrasing this quite right when I think about, is there a way we need to change like the cultural narrative to soften imposter syndrome's hold on us? And I, I don't know, or it, what are, what are those structural factors that are impacting it? Is it just an internal job and it's there because, Hey, it's just our human nature that, you know, that this is a part of us. You know, how do you think about this in terms of, you know, what do, what do we need to take on as individuals and what can organizations and frankly, society or cultural changes, yeah. what can be done there? So one of the things that organizations need to be doing is looking at how alpha male their culture might be. Yeah. The more alpha male and competitive the culture, the more likely both men and women are to struggle with imposter syndrome because the, there's then a real consequence of us not meeting those standards. We're being judged by the company, not evaluated, judged by the company. Mm. So it will exacerbate us judging ourselves. And the other thing that can happen in organizations that are highly competitive is leaders become allergic to the F word. Okay. And by this, I mean feelings. So don't worry. I'm not about to swear <laughs> on your show. Yeah? It's, it's feelings are seen as the domain of the human resources team. Yeah. The thing is that we are human beings. Yeah, we're not human doings. We all get that now. But if we have to show up at work as a robot and we've spent half the night telling ourselves a story of if one of my boss today finally finds out that he or she made a mistake hiring me, that person is going to perform differently. So that side of it, the cultural side of it is one thing. But the other thing that's really important, and this is one of my big missions, is to remove the taboo around imposter syndrome because it's an identity level issue and because it creates this existential crisis we work incredibly hard to hide it so everybody running it pretty much thinks they're the only one and if I'm running a keynote for an organization on this I'll always make sure there's a point in the keynote where the chat goes crazy because everybody's like it's not just me and I can do something about it yeah but because we think we're the only one and we're somehow broken and this thing is incurable, by the way, which isn't true, and then we think that we, we can't be fixed and we feel such a deep sense of shame that we work even harder again to hide it. Now, if we could get organizations to the stage where talking about imposter syndrome and asking for help with it is as okay as saying, hey, I need to dive in a bit more deeply with Microsoft Excel, can you imagine? how it would set people free to fulfill their potential, to have thriving teams and to grow the business's bottom line. No, this is brilliant. And I, 
You know, one of the things you're making even me realize is I'm wondering, and I'm feeling bad, Claire. I'm like, am I like making it taboo for my clients to kind of say that they are, you know, suffering from imposter syndrome? And I shouldn't, I, I certainly don't minimize it. And I, I, I yeah. don't want to minimize it when, if they use that language, but sometimes I, I want people to feel, see the distinction between, Hey, I'm, I'm on a new growth curve. It's just, I need to build my capability as you're saying and get some additional skills. And they have that within them. And there's, I, at least my belief, and I've heard it from others is that there are going to be times when we're going to be uncomfortable because we are on that new growth curve, but I don't want to minimize either what you're saying, this, this challenge with imposter syndrome. And I'm curious if there's any, um, words or language that you guide people in terms of how to have a conversation about this because, you know, so often, especially for women, I've been told this, like, act like a duck, come on top, (laughs) legs underneath, right? And also it's kind of like, you know, the people that get praised are those that are just calm, cool. And and that's important too, right? To to be able to kind of maintain in, and you talk about this in the book in terms of talking about Mm -hmm. resilience, but, um, yeah. Is there a way that we need to learn how to hear that and respond to it in a really productive way for people on our teams? It's a really great question. I want to start by saying that this whole thing about stretching comfort zones, those of us who are ambitious, yeah, if we don't get to stretch those comfort zones and have that sense of achievement, we actually get depressed really quickly. <laughs> so we have this thing where we actually have to go through that growth curve And the key to sustainable ambition is making the going through the growth curve a healthy experience, not a destructive one, yeah? Now, if you're a coach or you're a leader or you're a line manager and you think somebody in your team might be running imposter syndrome, the key is not to sit there and go, hey, I think you've got imposter syndrome. Not that you or I or anybody else on this session would, but it's really easy to say because we're excited and it's like, we want to help you. I would start with a client with my magic question. So you're talking about something they want to achieve, right? And you haven't taken the action yet. This is a key. So they've agreed it and they haven't taken it. You just open it up saying, I'm not judging you here. I just like to explore what's really going on below the surface. I can't do that because I haven't done that yet because let five or six answers bubble up. What you're looking for there is the distinction between the skills and the identity. Mm. So that will help you know as a coach, a leader, or a manager, okay, this is a skills gap. Or, okay, this is a skills gap plus imposter syndrome. Or, no, this is really imposter syndrome. So this helps give you that information. It helps give them the awareness. Then the next step is to start talking about the behaviors. Okay? And I talk about in that situation, I talk about people running imposter syndrome. So it's like a computer program because that tells the unconscious mind, I can shift this. Yeah. If it's something we have, then I have imposter syndrome and I'm going to keep it, whatever happens. Yeah. Or I've got to find a way to give it away. I'm running imposter syndrome. So you talk about the specific behaviors you've noticed that make you curious whether they're experiencing something that's called imposter syndrome. Yeah. Which is where we're scared that people will find out we're a fraud. If you do that and you are completely open to them saying, actually, no, even if you really know in your heart it's a yes, yeah, that's great, but you've opened up the discussion. But chances are they'll sit there and they'll just go, oh, is that okay? Yeah, and they'll open up to being supported and you'll see that sense of relief. And what can work incredibly well as well, if it's authentic, is for the leader to talk about their own experience first. Yeah, when I was doing this particular thing, I noticed I had these behaviors, these feelings, And I've since realized that was something called imposter syndrome. And I put up with it and struggled with it on my own. And I now know I didn't have to. With you, what I'm seeing is this, this, and this. And I'm wondering if it might be the same thing for you. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love it. And I'm throwing in brilliant because I love that term. And since I'm talking with someone from the UK, I I feel like I can get away with it, which typically I cannot. (laughs) Exactly. I think it's just because you're bringing the accent, Claire. So it gives me permission to go ahead. Happy to oblige. (laughs) Yes. But I need to know, Kathy, are you a scone or a scone lady? (laughs) Oh, gosh. I I feel like I'm going to get in trouble here if I answer that one. We have we have both in my family, so you're fine. Okay, I go with scone, but I mean maybe I need Perfect. to learn. Okay, uh, <laughs> so I know this is probably going to be um, 
a challenging, you've, you've just given us some great tips. And I think, you know, your book has so many wonderful exercises in it, you know, to go through and to help people. You also have programs as well. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's not fair to ask you like, uh, to, to give us all the tips and tools to address, uh, you know, imposter syndrome, you know, uh, limiting beliefs, et cetera here. But I'm wondering if there's a quick tip you might be able to share with, you know, with list- listeners in terms of you just gave us a great place to start for like managers or leaders who might be working with people on their teams. If one is an individual kind of wondering about this and wanting to take a look at the, this, is there a place you might suggest that they start? Okay. So the first thing, if you are a manager or you want to do something about it for yourself, is before we can shift from that negative self-talk to the positive, we have to go through neutral. Okay. Now here in the UK, we drive cars with gear sticks, which I think you guys called stick shifts. Yeah. That's right. Um, So in the UK, we can't go from like first to second without going through neutral or you have a very expensive repair bill. And my first, my driving instructor was seriously scared because I tried it every lesson. When we try to flip from negative to positive, what happens is it sets up a massive inner conflict, but also our system is flooded with those stress hormones. And to think of something positive when we're primed for negative emotions, thinking back to that stress cycle is incredibly hard. So one of the things that I teach people to do is to ground the stress energy. So a simple grounding breath, okay? Feet flat on the floor, doing some deep sighing breaths in through the nose, out with a sigh. And you just place your hand over your diaphragm, so between the rib cage and the belly button. Close your eyes if that feels safe. Obviously, don't do this, please, if you're driving listening to this. Yeah. (laughs) And then in your own time, you would do 60 seconds of just breathing in and out at the level of your hand being aware of the physical sensations of your body as you breathe. That is enough to reset the stress response. Now, when we've done that, we're in a place of relaxed alertness. The choices we make from that space are very different to the choices we make when we're stressed and worried. So if you're doing an intervention with a team member or a client or a colleague or a loved one, if you to try to talk to them about imposter syndrome when they're high as a kite, what's going to happen is the backfire effect will kick in. They will defend their right to feel the way they do. If you can get them into neutral and then have that conversation and talk about which solutions might be out there, then you're going to find that they're much more open to it. The resistance is lower. And it's the same for ourselves. You know, I have obviously a lot of techniques that help you clear it out once and for all. But if you do just one thing as a result of today's episode, whenever you catch those thoughts going, do that deep grounding breath, okay? And then you can ask yourself my magic question, what do I want instead? And the key here, what do I want instead? Let the answer bubble up. It needs to be something within your control because we can only change ourselves, not others. It needs to be phrased positively because if I said right now, do not think of a pink donkey in a blue tree playing saxophone, you'd be able to tell me what the tune was, yeah? Phrase it positively and it needs to be something specific. So not kind of like world peace. It needs to be, okay, the next time I'm doing a presentation to Joe, I want to feel like this. And then you start focusing on what the tiny actions you are that you can take towards that. So in that super simple process, you've gone through neutral. What do I want instead? That's the question I use with clients to turn them from problem to solution. And by making it something within your control and specific that you can take action on, you're reclaiming your personal power. Yeah, and that sounds so super simple, and yet it's incredibly potent and has the power to change your life forever. Yeah, I love this. And I that's something that really resonated with me and came through in the book, this powerful question of like, what do I want instead? And you, yeah. you phrase it differently for different exercises, but this is wonderful and such a helpful thing to share. So thank you. Claire, I could talk to you about this for a long time. You have so much knowledge and this has been really fabulous to really demystify this and start to reshape Mm -hmm. perhaps how people think about imposter syndrome and in a way that they can feel really empowered around uh, both being able to acknowledge it, have a conversation about it, and then to start taking steps in how to manage it and live with it. Um, and or quiet it for good. So um, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been fabulous. 
you know, you just gave us some great tips for both leader, for individuals, ourselves. If I could ask, what's a final piece of advice you might leave our listeners with? Do something, please. <laughs> yeah, please, I, I implore you, okay? Take one action in the next 24 hours to move you towards setting yourself free from imposter syndrome because now you know that you can. Why put up with it for one day longer? Yeah? So, I don't know, maybe come and find me on LinkedIn or something. I'm the only one there. Claire Yosa and DM me. Connect and DM and let me know what is your next 24-hour action and then let me know when you've done it. And I will be there with my virtual pom-poms as your cheerleader. So go and take action. You don't have to spend another day feeling like this. I love Please. it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and where can people find you on, on the, online to keep in touch? And I'll certainly capture this in the show notes. Thank you, Kathy. So my main website is clairyosa.com. I have an entire website on imposter syndrome called ditchingimpostorsyndrome.com. And the main place I hang out on social media is either LinkedIn or Instagram. Perfect. And as I said, I'll capture that in the show notes. Claire, this has been fabulous. Thank you again for being on and educating both me and my listeners on imposter syndrome. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's been an absolute joy to talking to you. And I really hope everybody listening has found this useful. Great. Find more inspiring interviews and get show notes for this episode at sustainableambition.com slash podcast. Make sure you don't miss an episode or my insider tips, guides, and tools by signing up for Sustainable Ambition Forum, my twice monthly newsletter. Sign up at sustainableambition.com slash subscribe. Thanks again for joining me. Speak with you next time.